Good morning everyone and welcome to this Health Service Journal webinar exploring how the Care Quality Commission and NHS Improvement can collectively regulate providers. My name is Sharon Brennan, I'm a correspondent at HSJ and also your chair for today's event, which is being run in association with Redoubt's solicitors. I'm pleased to be joined by Professor Sir Mike Richards, Chief Inspector of Hospitals at the CQC, Dr Cathy McLean, who is Executive Medical Director at NHS Improvement, and Errol Archer, Senior Associate at Redoubt Solicitors. Together, we are going to be discussing the state of play six months on from the coming together of the Trust Development Authority and Monitor. The creation of NHS Improvement was a major change. It not only brought the regulation of all trusts under one body, it also signified a move away from regulators merely identifying a problem and towards them offering support in finding a solution. A particularly big question has been how NHS Improvement can work with the CQC as both organisations are clearly focused on quality. It is a question we will be exploring further today. Our debate is going to be an interactive one. If there is anything you would like to ask the panel, please do submit a question. To do so, just follow the prompts on your screen. I'll bring in thoughts from viewers as the debate progresses. But I'd like to kick off by asking the opening question myself. And it's to Cathy. Cathy, can I ask, where, you can, where, you consider, where do you consider we stand six months after the creation of NHSI? And what do you think have been the successes and also some of the challenges? OK, thank you, um, Sharon. So I think the, the critical thing is that we are only six months into this journey. Um, I think sometimes it feels as though we've been around for longer, but actually it is only six months. So I think the first thing is we've actually managed to bring the organisations together, Monitor, TDA and part of NHS England. Um, and, and I think that's a really critical thing to have done. I think we've built relationships with other organisations. Obviously, we're going to go on to talk about our critical relationship with, with CQC uh, this morning. Uh, but in terms of some of the successes, I think that the work's gone on. And, um, for example, we've, we've had three organisations have come out of spe uh, quality special measures already. Um, we've developed uh, with colleagues in other organisations. We've got planning guidance that's three months early. Um, we've done a lot of work with regard to agency spend and that's been coming down. And there's a range of other things. But I think given we're such a new organisation and we've had to build ourselves, carry on the work uh, and develop our approach to improvement. Uh, and there's lots to say about how we've done that and yeah. I'm sure we'll come on to it. But I, I think we're making extremely good progress, um, uh, you know, even at this very early stage. Okay, so moving to um, Mike, um, it's clear that uh, one of the key challenges will be ensuring that the CQC and NHS Improvement have distinct identities, but also work together. Um, how are you seeking to address that challenge from the CQC side? Well, just building on what Cathy was saying. I mean, first of all, we are building on firm foundations. Uh, Cathy and I were working together when she was uh, enrolled with the TDA, um, and a lot of work on, uh, first of all, us identifying trusts that were struggling, recommending special measures, and then the TDA doing a lot of work to um, improve um, quality there. So we're, we're not starting from scratch. I think that that is important. Um, and But we are working hard now to make sure we are working effectively, but also independently. Um, our, our job is very clearly to assess the quality of care, and you know our five key questions, safe, effective, caring, responsive, well-led, um, and we will do that, and we will then present the res results to uh, NHS improvement. And, of course, when we find real problems, we communicate that immediately. We don't wait for the report. We just get on and, and share that information with the trust itself, but also with NHS improvement. So we're doing that. Um, we are... We're probably in touch 
not quite daily, but, but getting on that way um, about one thing or another. But we're also making sure we've got the structures right so that throughout the sort of hierarchy of CQC and the hierarchy of um, NHS improvement, we will be matching people so that for a particular trust, we know exactly who is the relationship owner on both sides. OK, so perhaps could you give an example of where maybe you've disagreed in the past and how you've resolved that um, in the last six months as perhaps how you would have resolved it in the past? In all honesty, I don't think we had that many dis disagreements in the past. Um, I think it is easier working with a single body than, than with two. Um, and so I welcome the fact that our Monitor and TDA have come together as NHS improvement. But I worked with the two separate organisations uh, before that. Um, and a lot of our work clearly is around the trusts that are struggling most. It is much easier to do that with one organisation and have a clear view of what it is that we are observing and then leaving it to NHS improvement to say what are they going to do to oversee the improvement. OK, bring in Errol into the discussion. Um, what are your thoughts on the CQC and NHS improvement relationship and how do you think it should evolve in the coming months and years? Well, I think the, the single oversight <coughs> framework that has just come out from NHSI is quite a comprehensive um, look forward as to uh, the direction in which NHSI wants to go. I think the key challenge for NHSI is whether they are effectively able to move away from what was previously a very tough regulatory approach as monitor, where it was much more stick than carrot, to an organisation that can support trusts be they foundation trusts and non-foundation trusts. I think that's the first challenge for NHSI. And certainly they've, they've started off, I would say, on a positive footing. Uh, but I, I think there's certainly a culture shift that's required. Um, working ahead, looking ahead to working with CQC, um, what are the challenges there for CQC and NH NHSI working together? Um, well, I think that is a uh, question of communication. There's been talk of a memorandum of understanding between the two bodies. Uh, it'll be interesting to know how progressed that is at the moment um, from Mike and um, Cathy. And well, Cathy, Cathy yes. did you want to come in on the point about uh, the carrot versus the stick, as uh, Errol put it? Yes. So. <clears throat> The, the word itself, NHS improvement, um, indicates you know where where we're trying to position ourselves. Now, obviously, we haven't got rid of the the regulatory mm. uh, framework; it has to remain because that is you know uh, a legal status. But our focus is very much on how we offer support. And you've referred Errol to the single oversight framework, and what that does is indicate really where the support will be most needed and at what level. So, you know, those in, in, the, in the segment one, which is that the, the um, uh, a relatively small number, about 35 organisations are, uh, are currently in that area. Um, on the whole, if they want support, it'll be something they will go and seek. But actually, most of them will be providing and, and available for, to others to learn from. So, we have a gradation of that, but very much our um, focus is on providing that, uh, not just ourselves, but helping point to other good practice. We've got a directorate of improvement, um, but in addition, the whole organisation is focused on support and improvement. And I think as one of the things that has already been mentioned, Errol mentioned, it, a lot of this is around relationships. So we've built up our regional teams and have got more people who are closer to the organisations. Uh, and as Mike said, we'll, we know which in NHS improvement and who in CQC will be linking closely with the organisations. They, they will know them well and be able to help with that sort of menu of, of support. Um, so, and I think the regulatory framework is there actually to be part of that. So, uh, it, it, you know, it's less about the the stick element of that mm. as opposed to using that as an enabler and, and part of the, the overall support offering. You mentioned the single outcome framework. Um, recently the CQC said that um, its own rating system and the new NHS improvement rating system um, aren't intended to align. So I was just uh, considering how do you think it's helpful to trust to have kind of two separate systems of ratings? I think, I mean, Mike might want to say something about this, but uh, obviously I think what you're referring to is the, is the um, consultation. We, we did a consultation and CQC, obviously mm. uh, in dialogue with us and through formal consultation responses, made those. I, I, 
what we're really clear about, and I think Mike and I and, and other people in, the, in our organisations are really aligned around, is we are aiming for an aligned situation and we're on a journey towards that. I don't know. If yeah, abs understand. Absolutely. I think the priority for NHS improvement was to bring together the frameworks that TDA and, and Monitor had had, and that's the single part of it. Now it's going to, the next stage is getting one that, that really maps across between our two organisations. And I can tell you that at, at every level uh, in the two organisations, there is that absolute commitment to get there. But these things aren't necessarily easy. Um, mm. So um, I'm sure we'll come on to talk about you of resources that's one of the areas mm. that we are that, that we are still talking about but we are for example already working very hard to align what we really mean by well led um, so that's an area where um, actually monitor had a framework on, on well led and have done for a long time um, we have developed a framework uh, very much in consultation with professor michael west and others over the, the last three years what we're now trying to do is to align those get the best of both basically um, so so that's an area where we are very constructively working together uh, right now um, you mentioned uh, trust in separate, you know, in, in the two systems. Mm -hmm. There are some that have been rated differently by NHS Improvement as to CQC. So, for example, St George's that just entered special measures from the CQC wasn't placed in special measures by NHS Improvement. So in scenarios like that, how are you expecting the trust to respond to the two bodies? Well, I think we're using... That, that there are two major areas. One, one is what are they like on quality and the other is where are they on finance. Mm. Um, and certainly at the moment, we are the key regulator of quality um, and NHS Improvement is the key regulator of finance. So um, I think it makes complete sense that the, there could be two different views there. But w what is certainly the case um, until now, and I'm very pleased about, is that every time we have recommended special measures on the grounds of quality, our, our view has been accepted. I don't think there's any times it's the other way when NHS Improvement have come to us and said, are you really sure that one shouldn't go into uh, um, special measures? So I think we have got that alignment around uh, the quality, but at the moment it is NHS Improvement's task to do that regulation of finance. Yeah. So I think that moves on to a nice opening to talk about use of resources. Um, obviously, the CQC is intending, as I understand it, to introduce a use of resources rating within its inspections next year. Um, in the scenario where a organisation is doing well on quality but not doing well on finances and hasn't got them under control, which, uh, which issue would supersede the other in terms of the final rating? I don't think it is a question of one superseding the other mm. because actually unless we've got the efficiency built in the quality is not going to be sustainable um, and and so we've got to look at that sustainability um, and and so we, we are saying that neither trumps the other um, actually how we get to exactly that point um, is, is what we're working on but um, we've got to have both quality and efficiency if we're going to have sustainability so I obviously I do understand a response but as you'll be rating um the key areas separately and obviously we'll come out with a final rating for each area and then it has to come to an overall one. Um, so again, if, if they're quite disparate. And, and, and if, I, if I had the exact answer for you now, I would give it to you. Yeah. Um, that's what we're working on and what, we, but what we're absolutely committed to doing is to working with NHS Improvement on this. So it won't just be NHS Improvement's uh, approach or CQC. Okay. We're com committed to having a joint approach. Did you want to come in at all on, on the issue of um, kind of uh, rating use of resources? Because obviously NHS yes. Improvement has pushed ahead with that in terms of its single outcome framework. Yes. So uh, as Mike says, we're, we're working together on that. And I think that whilst the CQC will um, absolutely be assessing quality, um, the role for NHS Improvement in the assessment of finances will also be taken into account. So it will be very much a joint uh, approach and this is a journey that we're on um, and in terms of how we've rated organizations um, our segment four has been that is those organizations that have been in special measures and uh, you know it, there's a timing issue as well so mm. you know when we make those announcements and when we change the the segment there is also important but I think the critical thing is that we see quality and finance as two sides of the same coin we put that in our provider roadmap, in fact, before we even came into, into being. Uh, and as Mike says, it, there is no 
point in ending up with you know improved quality of the whole organization is simply unsustainable from a financial position so we are trying to get to that point where we're very clear um, and have a joint um, view uh, in, in the in the rounds really around those things perhaps it's a good time to bring in Errol here we have a question from the audience um, Jaka has asked how are the CQC and NHS improvement working together to protect whistleblowers um, who could of course play an important role in identifying problems and so allowing quality improvement. So obviously you mm. have a strong understanding of the law. I mean, do you think yes. it's good enough to protect whistleblowers to come forward? Uh, well, I, I think the, the legislation is there <coughs> to protect whistleblowers. Whether whistleblowers feel comfortable to exercise uh, that important role will depend on the culture of the organisations. And that will, de will uh, depend to a great degree on how um, well led those organisations are uh, and that's a key factor that comes back also to the issue of quality. I, I would just going back to the previous mm. question, I would agree with Sir Mike and with Cathy that you rarely see a provider who is providing a safe quality service without also being well led and having a good governance framework. I think they do go together. But in terms of uh, an effective whistleblowing system, that's got to be led from the top. Uh, the legislative framework is there to facilitate that. And the question is whether there are any other things that uh, NHSI, that CQC, can do as key players in the sector to encourage um, trusts um, to, to create that sort of culture. Um, and do you feel that um, there is enough support for whistleblowers to come forward? Because obviously, referring back to one of the CQC um, reports, I believe you went into Mary Stopes because of a uh, whistleblowing concern. That, that was undoubtedly one of, one of the areas of, of, of mm. concern that, uh, that, that alerted us to, and want, made us want to go in to uh, look at those services. I, I think more generally, you know, whistleblowers have raised concerns that have been very important in a number of different trusts. And so it is very important that staff should be able to raise concerns. In an ideal world, they should raise the concerns internally, and they should be listened to, and they should be acted on. But we have to acknowledge that that isn't always the case. Um, and so... Um, whether they then blow the whistle to CQC or to NHS improvement, of course we will then make sure between us um, that uh, we know about it and, and act on it. And, and so there are a number of cases where um, we have, have acted on that. And of course the other new thing is that we've now got the National Guardian yeah. um, and who has taken up uh, post um, and the network of local guardians um, is coming into place really very rapidly across the country. So um, I think that is another a safeguard for people um, so that the, the National Guardian really is there to support the local guardians and to deal with tri really tricky cases. And I think, um, just to, to, to I agree with all of that, the, um, one of the things in terms of our improvement role um, and, and working with organisations around well-led and so on is, is the culture within the organisations. And I think that's absolutely critical. The engagement of the staff uh, in what they're doing, their ability to, to feel safe in order to raise concerns within, as Mike says, within the, within the normal business, if you like. Um, uh, but there is this safeguard that if it doesn't happen within the normal business, they can blow the whistle. Uh, and there are, plenty, there are plenty of examples where that's happened with us and or with CQC. And, and we, we share those uh, yep. situations so that we can <coughs> make sure that, that things are looked into. Um, and, and just building on that, that, that assessment of culture is really a key, key element. When we do our inspections, um, <coughs> we clearly have the NHS staff survey um, before we go into uh, mm. a, an organisation, which is an incredibly valuable um, uh, survey. I would just encourage all trusts to survey all their staff, not just to do a, a sample, because uh, I think they will find that even more valuable. Um, and then they will have the numbers so that they can see which location or which group of staff it is uh, that may be particularly uh, concerned. Um, it's also a very good way of, of observing change in, in culture over time. And sometimes people say culture takes decades to change. Actually, no, it doesn't. Um, under really good leadership, it can change remarkably quickly. And we've seen that in a number of places um, where the, the staff morale, the staff engagement changes within a year or so. Uh, so it, it can be done. Um, we have a question in from the audience. Um, Cara has asked, um, can the speakers give a practical insight into how support will work given limited resources system-wide? So obviously this probably is referring back to that 
um, uh, the SOF, the Single Outcome Framework, um, and how you expect uh, trust to improve given uh, limited resources to perhaps do capital projects and that kind of thing. So, um, so indeed, some things do require capital, but actually an awful lot of the improvement that's, um, that's helpful um, doesn't really require a great deal of, of rebuilding. It's actually about how, uh, how staff are taking on, if you like, uh, the best practice. And so, so we've got many different tools in, in, the, uh, in the toolbox, one of which is to help, and, and CQC's inspections and ratings are really helpful in this, is identifying places where they may have a, an area of outstanding practice. Um, we can help with uh, supporting organisations to develop an improvement methodology. We know that those organisations which have been rated outstanding, which are, I think, Mike, there's eight now, or that sort of yep. order. We, we get the odd extra one and try to remember how many. Well, but there's eight, uh, I think. Um, and really one of the themes it, it, amongst those is that they usually have an improvement methodology. Um, so we can support in, in that way. And for those trusts that are mm. most struggling we do have some additional resource that we can help and target particularly at, at those. And within NHS Improvement, there are teams like the uh, Emergency Care Improvement Team, the ESIP team, that will help in urgent care. Um, but there's a whole range of, of things. And, and we have an improvement directory that we point uh, organisations to so they can go and, and see where others are doing well. Or um, I I Variation is huge. And, and just sort of taking up what is already going on that's the best, I, I think, is, is really important. Sometimes, yes, they do need new fabric to do the, the, mm. the, the business in, but uh, more often than not, it's, it's about learning uh, and, and, and sometimes learning from within their own organisation. Sometimes in really challenged organisations, we have an oasis of, of excellence, don't we? <coughs> not infrequently. Um, I, I wind the clock back a couple of years to somewhere like Wexham Park, mm. where um, there was a lot of services at that time that were inadequate, but children's services were good throughout the intensive care unit. Really, the only problem was they couldn't get people off the intensive care unit. Um, so, but you, you get that variation within a trust, but then that's a trust that, when it was acquired by Frimley Park, um, moved really rapidly in terms of its improvement um, and in terms of what the staff themselves were saying about it. Um, the, the proportion of staff saying that they would recommend it as a place for treatment skyrocketed um, over a, a, a year. So I think what we can do is to shine the spotlight, to help trusts uh, know where their own problems are, sort of that, that if you like, a consultancy role in, in sh showing where the problems are, um, and not just saying it is in maternity, but saying what it is in maternity that, that's not working. Um, we can also then uh, point people to other places, as Cathy has said, that are doing an outstanding job. And there's been far too little uh, exchange across the NHS in the past. Um, of, and, and this goes back to when Bruce Keogh did his review of the 14 trusts with high mortality. One of the findings there was how insular some of those trusts were. And they, they might have really good trusts only 20, 25 miles away. So I, I think helping people see where they might go to get um, to see what's being done differently is, is important. So taking, um, moving on from that comment that you've taken there, um, where trusts are struggling to get out of special measures, what is yeah. the next step in that? I mean, is it going to be a, a kind of a formal mergers? I mean, where, where is your thinking evolving? So coming to me, yeah. Um, so, of you, so I, I think I, I think we have learnt an awful lot about struggling trusts through the special measures mm -hmm. program over the last three and a half years. Um, remember, it, it was it was a new idea, uh, certainly in, in healthcare, uh, back in July 2013, um, and we have seen some remarkable turnarounds. Some where it has been much more difficult. We've, I, I think. The improvement directors, for example, that um, are so now I think universal um, through NHS improvement, um, when a trust is in special measures, they can be very valuable. I think the external support um, and whether that, that is in the form of buddying or whether it is in the, in the form of acquisition ultimately, um, again, we are learning about that and I think we are seeing s several cases where not necessarily going as far as acquisition, getting a very experienced chief executive also to be chief executive of a different organisation. Um, that, we believe, is, is also driving change quite rapidly. I think 
Yes, and if I, I agree completely, I think we have learned an awful lot over the last three and a bit years that uh, this has been going on. Um, and I think that where we might initially, for example, have just said, OK, well, we'll, get a, we'll ask a, a, a good trust to help just one buddy. We, we've actually learned that you probably um, need several. So if maternity is an issue, we, we have a, a buddy arrangement with an organisation that's doing well on that. And they, you might have a range. And, and we pay particular focus, uh, pay particular attention to the leadership, you know, helping with the governance. There are some themes that emerge, and therefore we've been able to learn how we help put those right. But uh, as Mike says, sometimes it does become a more formal leadership arrangement mm. with another organisation. And again, we've seen some remarkable success, as Mike's referred to the, the Frimley Park and, and Wexham. But, you know, we've got other situations in which that's really helping and, and varying degrees of formality of that. Sometimes it's just sharing some staff um, uh, who, who are able to go and work cheek by jowl alongside Ooh. the staff already and in, in the organisation and if you like transfer skills uh, and give people the, the sort of space to improve. Everybody wants to do a good job, that's the thing. Um, and sometimes they just need a little bit of extra support and help in order to then go and, and fly on their own really. So if you're seeing um, benefits from more of a formalised buddying system, will there be um, financial rewards to those trusts that are doing very well and are expected to then extend their help and support to others? Obviously there's a time issue involved in that. In, in terms of, I'm not quite sure, in terms of financial reward, um, obviously if you're uh, working with another organisation, um, there may be a need if you've got to backfill staff and so on. So at that sort of level, sometimes we're able to assist with that kind of thing. If it's a more formal and the leadership is, is taking on uh, another part of the system, obviously the two then come together so it becomes a bigger entity. Um, but in terms of direct financial reward, I don't, I, I'm not sure that we're, we're quite in that space. May I just come in there yes, in, in relation do. to the, the initial question about providing support without putting any additional financial burden on the provider? Well, we must remember we're NHSI is still stuck with the previous legisl legislative framework that Monitor had. So where a trust falls within the third or fourth segment and uh, mechanisms need to be put into place to impose and mandate support, then they're still reliant on the old uh, provisions of the Health and Social Care Act 2012. And we, we can see, which is um, imposing a discretionary requirement or an, uh, requesting an enforcement undertaking. And we can see from NHSI's involvement with St George's um, Foundation Trust, what they flagged up as the support there is support with a management improve, improvement plan, support with putting a management improvement leader in place and also support with dealing with the physical estate of the building. Now the first two of those are common, uh, were common uh, types of support or enforcement that were previously used by Monitor and they don't come free of charge. Um, so I think there is a challenge to, for the regulators to provide support that does not also place an additional financial burden on the trust. Um, I think that, that is the key, that's a, an important challenge. Um, if we look also at some of the other regulators in other sectors, for example the Health and Safety Executive, um, this is a regulator that has a very good reputation that engages very early and widely with, um, with providers and businesses um, and shares information and is really geared up to sharing information and to supporting um, the, the parties they regulate. And I think the, the key challenge is how uh, NHSI in particular can reposition itself um, to be able to provide that sort of support to providers rather than relying on the old mechanisms that were previously used. Is that something you're looking to um, move towards or Yes, and I think from? I think, you know, where you, you select out a particular organization, there's there's a whole collection of other things that perhaps wouldn't have happened under uh, you know, under purely a regulatory approach and is now much more of a supportive one. Um, so, for example, we use the term improvement director, and I think that actually everybody's got a different view of what that is. In, in, for me, uh, and I think the way Mike has talked about them as well, uh, focus on quality and somebody who's often got a clinical background uh, and will go and uh, help the organisation 
both in developing their quality improvement plans, but actually then implementing those, getting alongside people. So I think that's an important, important thing. The, the, the buddying and linking with other organisations is, is, is another part of it. And I think that it, it, our experience is that for most organisations, it doesn't really feel so much an imposition as actually they welcome the, the help that we're offering. Certainly that's my experience. And a lot of that comes down to the relationship that you build up with with uh, with the the people that the senior people in particular is is where we would be linking, um, and I certainly find that very often you know they want lots of conversations and you talk through how you best position things and, and we do consult with them. So when when we're going to offer some help, we, we do share that with them and they have a chance to say we don't think this would help or what we do think. Um, so I think it's a journey and I think some of it's around changing some of the language that we use around that as well maybe coming from your point, if there's a, a, a difference of opinion between the trust and NHSI and perhaps CQC in terms of whether that support is required, um, would it, is it mandated? I mean, if, they, if a trust feels that they don't need the support that you're offering, but you feel they do, how is that um, scenario resolved? Well, clearly in segment three and four, and, 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 and to be fair, uh, much of this is where a trust is in special measures for one reason or another. Um, you know, the, the word mandate is there, so we can say you do need some sort of help. We're very open to discussions about what precisely is going to be the most effective help. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we, we come together and have those discussions. I think the other thing is fair to say, and I think, Mike, you and I have talked about this many times, is one of the things, if you're in difficulties, is actually recognising it, kind of accepting that things are, say, CQC have assessed and said, you have got some inadequacies. We know, and, and we have some experience of this now, is that where early on the leadership say, do you know, we recognise that, we want to work now to improve, they get, they, they improve far more quickly than those who, who spend a long time in the denial phase, um, because it is a shock quite often. Mm. I mean, many already have, do recognise, they've realised, yeah. But I don't know, Mike, if you... No, I, I, was, I was going to come on to exactly the same, mm. same point. Yeah. Um, one of the best prognostic factors for improvement is acceptance. Mm. Um, converse of that is where trust, and we have seen examples of this, I think more in the early phases mm. of, of special measures, but we, I can think of two or three, um, where there was denial for a whole year that really there was a problem, and therefore almost a rejection of support from outside. Mm. Um, and then actually there came the acceptance, yes, please now help, and then things started getting better. So I think we have seen that pattern in a couple of places. Um, and um, I, I mean, people often may well challenge our judgments. I, I accept that. Um, but sometimes it really the, the evidence is absolutely clear-cut that there's a problem. Um, and if they can accept that, then they can accept support, then they can move on. So a challenging question from Alistair, a member of the audience. Um, given the conversation this morning about how um, well integrated and how well you work together, he has asked what public value is created by having both bodies regulating the same providers? And does there remain a clear rationale for the con continued existence of you both as separate entities? Does Alistair have a surname? <laughs> I'll just, ask, just have to ask that question. Um, but whoever the Alistair is, um, I, I think this is a process of evolution. Um, now, whether we will have separate quality and financial regulation in five years' time, who knows? Um, but I think this is where we are. We are making it work, and I think we're making it work effectively. Uh, I think it is considerably better that we have... Um, two organisations, not three. Um, so that, that, that is, that is pro progress. So um, I think we can make almost whatever system we've got work. I think as well there is something, um, certainly you know, at the moment, the quality regulator is CQC. And it, it has worked extremely well, actually, for, for uh, the, the assessment to be done and then the improvement to be from a separate organisation, but working closely so that we're really clear what needs to be done. As Mike says, we can't see way into the future, mm. but it, I think it does feel, and, and both, I'm sure, from your perspective and, and certainly from mine, where we are, to have that single oversight of all the providers, mm. the Foundation Trusts and the NHS Trusts, 
um, whilst it's an enormous task, it, it is at least you can take a sort of more unified and uh, uniform approach. And I think the interaction then that, uh, you know, for CQC and other bodies who have to interact with us, it does simplify things to some extent. And we're working further on that from a trust perspective to make it as simple as possible. Um, because that can be challenging if you're in, a, in an organisation and everybody's wanting different things. We're trying to work on on unified, um, uh, you know, if you like, data and so on, and, and we're not all asking yeah. different questions. I, th I think if you had um, my colleagues, either Steve Field or Andrea Sutcliffe, what yeah. they might be here, they might be saying, oh, but where is the improvement organisation for either primary medical services or yeah. um, for adult social care? So I, I, th I think, again, um, we are where we are at the moment, but, but um, there isn't at the moment an organisation whose task it is to support G GP practices, for example, with improvement. Has there been conversation with NHS Improvement about filling that um, gap? Um, not, I don't, yet. not yet, I think, is the, is, is the answer. Um, but I think the model works pretty well for, for trusts and, and FTs at the moment. Yeah. We've got plenty on our plates with that mm. too. It's so maybe to put you on the spot slightly there, Mike, you said um, you, uh, you are where we are and you're making the system work. In an yeah. ideal world, what would you see the system being to work best? I, mean, I, I think, think we might well move in due course, but I'm not calling for this in any mm. sort of hurry, to an organisation that was the improver and an organisation that was both the, the financial and quality regulator. Um, that, that could happen, but um, I don't think it is a matter of saying this has got to happen now because I really don't think that would be helpful. So in that scenario, you would be seeing that the CQC would take on the financial regulation role and well, improve an organization will be taking on mm. regulation of both quality and finance uh, because as i said before you know we, we do see the link between quality and uh, efficiency that in terms of the sustainability so I, I think that is a a direction of travel things could go in i'm not calling for that as as a, any sort of matter of urgency because mm. i think we're doing really quite well as we are if, if i may yes, i, I think there are, <coughs> there are very strong arguments for a a single regulator covering both items. We've seen earlier on in the discussion that there's a certain overlap between the work that NHSI does in terms of governance and uh, leadership and also what CQC does in, under their well-led uh, category of inspection. Um, and we've also seen that both organisations are working together looking at the financial metrics that, mm. that they will both use. And I think there can be mixed messages as we discussed earlier that uh, provider that goes go out to providers as to who are they answering to, who are they, who do they need to engage with? Um, but I see this as a, a long engagement, uh, hopefully to a, a coming together to a single regulator at some point in the future. Not only for efficiencies within the organisation, but to ensure that providers know precisely where they stand. Uh, and we've seen that that can be done without significant legislative change. Uh, with the appropriate, appropriate um, uh, structures in place. Uh, and that's something that I think would be beneficial. And I think it's also worth saying that all the arm's length bodies are working together uh, through the National Quality Board. Um, and both Cathy and I sit on that quality board along with people like Bruce Keogh from uh, NHS England, but also with NICE and with HE and uh, the, 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 all, all of the ALBs. Um, and I think we are now saying we really do have a shared commitment to, to quality. Um, and what we want to do is actually also to reduce the burden mm -hmm. on providers um, and so that we're not all asking them for different things but at the same time. We've seen some very good examples of where by working together, we can reduce the burden on an individual trust um, and a trust in special measures, uh, for example, where if we get one single oversight committee really working with that, we can all get our priorities laid out so that we're not all going in on separate days and asking them for different things. Um, and so that's something that we are committed to doing, but not just between our two organisations, but across all the arm's length bodies. So maybe perhaps looking to the immediate future, one of the big um, issues that HSJ has been covering a lot is obviously the STPs um, and they are due to you know be published between now and December we believe um, 
what consequences do you think the development of FTPs will have for regulation, given that uh, at the moment regional integration is not formalised through legislation? Yeah. So we currently regulate individual providers, yeah. that, that is individual providers who are registered with us and, and who we, we regulate. And they are also accountable for the care uh, that, that goes on within their, whatever their services are that they provide. Um, I am very supportive of accountable care organisations, so that where you, you see an acute trust may be also managing the community health services, but starting to manage um, primary care services and engaging very closely with social care. I mean, if you, if you look at Northumbria, uh, it is a, an, an example of something that's almost an accountable care organisation uh, right now. And we see it doing extremely well. And I think that then lines up the incentives in the right way uh, so that people will be cared for more in the community and less in, in hospitals. So I, I certainly support that. Then we will need to regulate that as, as an accountable care organisation. Part of that will be we still need to, to assess the quality of primary care, we will still need to assess the quality of community health services and the quality of the hospital, the acute services. That, um, so, but we within CQC can bring that together. Um, and we, we are um, thinking a lot about then how we would aggregate um, th those different services and, and rate them at the moment. And we'll be going out to consultation on that uh, before very long uh, as, as well. So we are absolutely committed that as new models of care come in, we will not be a barrier. We will, as long as people let us know what the new models of care mm. are, we can then uh, adapt our framework um, so that we can um, ass assess the quality and do the job that we're there to do in terms of regulation. So there is an intention to provide an actual rating for these new care models? Yeah, yes, exactly what form that's going to take is what we want to, to consult on. We are already in discussions um, with some of the, the chains that are emerging, or foundation groups, whatever you want to call them, um, and saying, if, for example, you've got a trust that is outstanding and it takes on a, uh, a trust that is inadequate. Do you inevitably then say, well, you aggregate all that together and it comes out as requires improvement? Or do you say what really the public need to know and patients want to know is that trust A is still outstanding, that that location, um, and the other locations have moved up from inadequate, let's say, to requires improvement. So that actually shows overall direction of travel that's positive. We are trying to reflect that in the way that we will be rating in the future. And so maybe bringing in a point that you raised earlier about uh, primary care not yet having an improvement um, uh, framework, do you feel that will be an issue when we move to STPs, that hospitals will be given support to improve and then there may be a gap with social care and, and, and primary care not receiving that? Well, I'm sure, you know, if, if they feel there isn't that there, which, which you, you're right, is there, it isn't formally there at, at the moment. Um, there are some elements of NHS England that provide some support and, um, uh, and improvement capability. So I'm, I'm sure over time that these, that will need to be, you know, looked at it in the rounds. Um, I think the other point I would make on the SDPs is, is you know, back to the sort of well-led element. Mm. Part of that we have expanded, obviously, to include, you know, in terms of leadership, how are people doing system leadership? It's not just all about their one organisation, but how are they working across a system? And that's, again, going to be really, really important and would almost certainly be part of any assessment of how, yeah. is, uh, how are organisations coming together to think not just about the boundaries of their own, but how they serve a population. And I think that feels as though we're moving very much yeah. more in that direction. No single provider can or should be an island. And so the leadership of any provider organisation have to work with, with others. Um, and we will reflect that in our well-led framework. So we are moving towards the end of our session. So perhaps to open it up to kind of the issues that you two are most looking towards, um, what would you say the priorities are for your relationship moving forward in the next six months to 12 months? What are the key issues you need to resolve? Or 
Well, well I mean, there, there are some practical issues, mm. like you probably have, still haven't got all your staff in place, right. um, and, but once that they are in place, we can then do this matching um, so that for individual trusts, we know exactly who it is within our organisation. That's a practical issue. We're well on the way to that, um, and it can be done. Um, we are already working at national level um, very well in terms of particularly the, the challenge trusts. I mean, we don't spend as long talking about the ones that are, are good or outstanding but for, for very obvious reasons. Um, we celebrate that, but, that's, but, but probably no more. Um, we've already said that we are working on this the framework for well-led, building on the experience of the predecessor organisations and saying how can we get to that so that we are clear that it wouldn't matter who was doing the assessment, we would come out with the same, same answer. Um, and then the, the bit that we've already talked about, about use of resources, that is probably the most challenging one. Um, but we are committed to, to going down that line and working out a way of doing it. So maybe briefly, we say use of resources is the most challenging one. What are the major concerns that you've got there trying to make it work across both bodies? Because obviously NHS Improvement has already come up with a, you know, a way of assessing resources. Yeah. Well, you, can, you, you come up with a way of uh, assessing f financial um, sustainability, absolutely. But is that the same as, uh, as assessing efficiency? So, for example, in an ideal world, we would be able to say, what is the efficiency at a service level? You know, how efficient is this A&E? How efficient is um, this um, um, uh, medical care, surgical care, maternity care, etc. We're yeah. quite a long way off having mm, the yeah. data that we need to, to do that. that. That's the direction of travel. And I think it's fair to say that we've, we've got the, um, the work going on around the model hospital uh, and so on and, yeah. and, the, and the weighted activity um, uh, efficiency sort of measures and so on. Those are in development and I think we've got those to do. But in terms quickly of, of you know, what are our biggest challenges uh, going forward, I think we, we work on a sort of process of, uh, you know, on a basis of no surprises. So we, we, we want to get upstream even further, I think, of where something may be going to go wrong because it's a lot, it's a lot better to sort of, uh, you know, help somebody, self, help an organisation early on rather than wait till things uh, become a problem. I think sorting out where we are exactly on, on financial special measures, quality special measures, and making sure we bring all of that together, the two sides of the same coin, I think is, is also very important. And, and supporting organisations as early as possible so that if they are in trouble, that they improve as fast as possible. And Mike's given some examples, and I, I think we'd, we'd like to see that progress. Well, I think it's uh, time to, unfortunately, wrap up our discussion. I'm sure we could continue for much longer. Um, I think our discussions today have made clear the challenges and opportunities as NHS, beds, NHS improvement beds in further, um, and it seeks to forge an identity which is distinct from, but obviously complementary to, the CQC. Um, I think it's now time for me to draw things to a close, and it remains for me to thank our panellists. So, Errol Archer from Redout Solicitors, many thanks. Professor Sir Mike Richards and Dr Cathy McLean, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Um, and also, of course, thanks to the viewers of our webinar. Um, we thank you for all your questions. I hope you found it an interesting and useful discussion. And goodbye for now. <laughs>